is Brian Brian Lender from the World Food Program. As many of you, I'm sure, know, they won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for 2020. Uh, so it's it's a great pleasure to to hear from them. So uh, Brian, take it away. And to do so, actually, I'm going to share Brian's screen. And uh, so let's see. Let me put up. Hi, Albert. Do you, just one quick thing. I just got a message to saying whether I wanted to, to unmute my microphone. So perhaps you're giving me access rather than, than to Brian. I just was wondering. That is interesting. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second there because then I, okay. Did... I'm gonna. That's it, that works. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, so Brian, you are listed as Laura and Laura, you're listed Brian for some reason, but okay. no matter what this, um, it looks like it's working. So let me get the presentation up and, and just mention Brian when you can, uh, when you want to move to the next slide and. I'll okay. No, thanks. Thanks everyone for inviting WFP to, to present at this conference. Uh, we'll, we'll get into the presentation fairly soon here when Albert puts it up. Uh, as mentioned, we, uh, we were very fortunate and uh, quite honored to be recognized by the, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee uh, for the work that we're doing around the world. Uh, it's a credit to the staff of, of WFP, absolutely, but also our partners, which I think includes you, because we are increasing our ability to respond uh, more accurately, more quickly, more prioritized in, in events of, of floods. So thank you very much for inviting us to this, this conference and allowing us to, to speak. So maybe we'll go to the, the next slide and I can just speak a little bit to WFP for those who don't know. Uh, we are a, a United Nations organization, of course. Uh, we have about 18,000 staff around the world. Uh, the vast majority of them are based in the field. Uh, our, our current budget is around $8.2 billion a year at the moment. Uh, we're entirely voluntarily funded. Uh, so we are uh, quite uh, grateful to the, the funding that has been provided by, by donors and others. At the moment, our current uh, scope of work uh, entails reaching about 138 million people. At the beginning of the year, it was about 100 million people. And then with, with the COVID-19 pandemic happening, uh, it scaled up to another 38 million uh, people with, with the impact, the economic fallout and the compounding impact of, of the COVID. So that's WFP in a nutshell. Uh, I'm Brian Lander, as already mentioned. I'm with the Emergencies Division at our headquarters in Rome. I'm overseeing uh, the units that support our operational and the response in the field. Uh, maybe we can just go to the next slide. Uh, within our division, we have a, a unit that specifically is focused on uh, geospatial support. Uh, Laura, who you heard earlier, is, is leading that unit. Uh, and essentially it is looking at pulling together data. I like the comment earlier about bridging that gap between science and users. And I think here you're starting to see really what that means in practice, uh, certainly for WFP and for the UN system. So we have a small, a relatively small unit, but it's, it's, uh, it's substantial enough to be supporting all our country offices around the world and our regional bureaus around the world, uh, with mapping with the analysis, with the data management and uh, really looking at where we can innovate more. Maybe the next slide. Uh, why are we interested in, in flooding? Uh, why are we giving this focus within WFP? And I think there is a, a recognition, as also mentioned earlier, that the floods are, are, are quite frequent and do affect a large number of people. So it's something where we want to get a better handle on how are we able to quickly respond and how are we able to get the type of analysis we need to know where to respond and provide that both to our own offices, but then our, our partners that are operating on the ground. So we've got a real interest in understanding 
how this is going to affect where we are operating and the people that are, are receiving our assistance. Uh, this is a, in recognition of, of the key importance of data preparedness. Uh, the more we're prepared with that kind of uh, analysis and, uh, and, and visualiza visualization, I would say, because that's often what uh, also helps uh, people understand what's happening, uh, we're just that much better prepared uh, to be able to respond. So one example of this is, is the partnerships that we're, we're developing with the people here in, in this conference. And uh, we've, we've taken this and, and utilized it in-house in to develop what we call an automatic disaster analysis and mapping tool. And this is, I'll give you an example of it as we go forward. It's been mainly used up until now for earthquake uh, detection and then alert and with tropical storms. And uh, we have actually used that for the current tropical storm in Nicaragua, uh, alerting the country office and the regional office to where it was going to hit, the possible paths it was going to take and the impact it would have. So that, that sort of alert system is, is very much in practice uh, in these two areas. We're now adding to that flood response. So I, I wanna take you through a little bit of what we're envisaging with, with, the, with the flood awareness and uh, alert system. So maybe the next slide. This is uh, just a shout out to all the partners that we have been working very closely with, including Cloud to Streets as was just uh, presenting to us, who we've just uh, re more recently signed an agreement with. But uh, this is just a quick overview of who we are working with. Maybe the next slide. So if you look a little bit historically, uh, the, this is a, showing where we received requests from our field offices for support in a flood response. And as you can see from 2017 to 2020, it's quite significant. Uh, and this alerted us to the fact that we needed to have the impact analysis, you know, what is it doing with the, to the infrastructure? How many people are affected in these floods? What is the type of impact on crops? So we're looking at this then to, to envisage how do we put into the place a system that's global and systematic to be able to respond to those requests more, um, more quickly, obviously, but then more accurately as well. Next slide. So here's an example of what we're putting in place with, uh, with as I mentioned before, that the, the Atom system uh, for floods. Uh, this is a map. Uh, I believe of Bangladesh, yes, in July of 2020 this year. Uh, it's giving you a lot of detail on where the flood uh, is happening, obviously, and how it relates to our own operations, and then where we can be then prioritizing in terms of bringing food to certain points, pre-positioning food, perhaps shifting from, from in-kind or, or you know, direct food uh, distributions to cash if there are access issues. So it's giving us a very succinct and, and quick snapshot for our country offices to use in their planning. Uh, this, this system is being tested now. Uh, we're expecting it to become fully operational in, in the second quarter of 2021, but we are putting into, into practice where we do see these, uh, these floods happening now. Next slide. So here's another example of the, the way that we're using this data. This, this is a map of West Africa, and it's overlaying where we have a presence around the world. So if you see the little circles and the, the triangles and the squares, those are our country offices, our sub offices, our field offices. And we can then get a sense very quickly of who's best place to be responding or who perhaps needs more support. Uh, quite often the case is that those colleagues on the ground may actually not be able to, they may be equally affected and therefore have to have uh, the extra support uh, to, to, to respond. These are all tough places to work. Uh, you don't have the type of access uh, that's, that's uh, very easy and, and obviously very much affected by, by flooding, but you've also got insecurity. Uh, for the vast majority of beneficiaries of WFP's assistance, they are affected by conflict. And so we're working in these areas that are, are quite difficult uh, in terms of governance, in terms of lawlessness and, uh, and access. So this gives you also a, a, a sense of scope in terms of where WFP is working, but then also how do we overlay that with, uh, with uh, the flooding uh, occurrence. This, this was a, a map that was developed in September and October of this year. Uh, the next slide, please. 
similar map, same region, but then looking at the, the rivers and the courses of the rivers and whether or not, you'll see the little red triangles and the yellow triangles indicating whether or not we're seeing increases or decreases in the level of the, of the rivers. And that again, allows for us to plan and to, and to take action sooner rather than later. Uh, quite often for WFP, what, what we're concerned about is that the impact of any of these disasters uh, will take away people's livelihoods. You lose cattle, you lose, I don't know, a cart that you use to go to the market. That has a huge impact on people because they cannot necessarily recover that quickly. So if we can pre-position our assistance in a way that allows people to retain those livelihood support uh, activities or, or tools, that's going to put us in a much better position coming out of the crisis. So a lot of this is allowing us to, to anticipate and to, and to look ahead as to what we, can, what we can be doing on the ground. Next slide, please. So I think this is, this is where it gets quite interesting for WFP because then what we've done is we've looked at the population uh, levels in the areas that are affected. And you'll see here the numbers by district coming down uh, in the different areas. This is Guinea, Mali, and Cote d'Ivoire. And this is giving us a sense of scale, a sense of impact, uh, because then we can overlay on that, you know, those families or those communities that are receiving uh, assistance from w WFP. That again allows us, as I said, to pre-position food, to pre-position the type of modalities that can respond to their needs. Uh, it helps us in our supply chain planning. Uh, if we had food coming into the country, perhaps we have to redirect it, or we need to bring food from other areas into, into these regions that are affected, depending on the scale of, of impact on, the, on the, those people. Uh, we can, and I'll come to a slide in a little bit uh, later, we can overlay that with routes into these towns uh, and markets and see if those are affected and whether or not we then have to redirect trucks or planes or, or whatever means we're using to get that uh, assistance to them. Uh, it also helps then obviously with the last mile logistics where we're looking at how close to these communities can we get and, and what is their means of access to us if, if, it's, uh, if it's quite difficult. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, quite often if it is entirely impossible, more and more we're discovering and, and expanding our ability to then distribute mobile cash through a mobile phone system. So it's an indicator of what do we need to do in the next day, the next two days to respond to these needs. So it's, it's, a, it's a quite powerful way uh, to support uh, decision-making and planning on the ground. The next slide, please. So again, this is just giving you examples of the type of maps and the type of uh, analysis that we're providing to our country offices. Uh, the, the Pakistan, West Africa, and Bangladesh maps were developed this year. Um, we are using forecast cast data. You'll see the blue square in the corner, which uh, is helping us then to project forward uh, rather than just looking at what's happening immediately. Uh, and the Cambodia uh, reference is to uh, the floods in 2019. These dashboards are, are published uh, publicly. They're, they're put onto RefWorld, so they are available to the humanitarian community or anyone else that would like to, to see what is happening in those countries at that time. Uh, the next slide, please. So here we're using, again, this this data on, on floods to then overlay, as I mentioned before, the routes that we're using to get into these various places. Um, so here we're looking at um, Sudan, and uh, this is a map that's being used by the logistics cluster. The logistics cluster is a coordination mechanism within this, the UN system and with partners to manage how do we move and uh, deliver supply across uh, a country and a region. So here we're looking at uh, how the floods are affecting those roads with, with the green still being accessible, the yellow being difficult and the, and the red being completely inaccessible. So it again tells us where are we needing to focus our efforts? Do we need to shift to other border crossing points or, or, or other means to get the, the assistance where it's needed? Uh, the next map, the uh, next slide, please. So here, this is a, another level of technology that we're putting in place in which this is where 
if we have needs in a very localized area to get even higher detail, we're using uh, drone imagery uh, for uh, getting a, a very close in view of what, uh, what impact the floods are having. Again, it's, it's very localized. Um, I believe that the map here is looking at what happened in Mozambique earlier this year uh, with the ECHO funded project. Um, but it gives you a sense of what additional level is, is possible in particularly large crises or areas that we feel that uh, we need that extra data to, to be able to do that. You see the icons on the side with the houses giving you an indication of how many houses are affected. And that'll tell you more or less if, if you've got five people per home, how many people you're, you're potentially going to be needing to, to assist. They may be on the move, they may be going to community centers. It just tells you um, very easily what, uh, what type of response might be needed. The next slide. So again, here looking at uh, uh, another uh, application of technology. This, this is using data from Airbus, um, which we've developed a, a partnership with and uh, very high resolution images. Uh, they're, they're allowing us to access that at no cost. Uh, this is in the Philippines uh, when the, the storm hit earlier and uh, allowing us again to, to get that kind of resolution that helps uh, drive planning and, and decision making. The next slide. Okay, so yeah, maybe we missed one, but anyway, that's fine. Oh, I can this go back. Of, um, of, uh, of the map and showing what we're doing uh, in, in Laos. Maybe I'll just go to the, the last slide and uh, give you a quick summary. So I think what we're learning and certainly uh, in the application of this kind of technology, but also from the, the, the earthquake experience that we've had and uh, for the cyclones and typhoons is that um, you know, innovation is, is quite uh, important and key and, and using the newest technologies in the best way we can uh, to visualize and to get that kind of information out to our field colleagues is so critical because it's, it's very hard when you're on the ground and you don't have that visibility on, on what's happening around you. Um, the ADAM program or the ADAM platform that we're developing, uh, it, it is a, a model and a, a tool that we're using to go global. Uh, it's because of our staffing and uh, uh, scope uh, of our activities around the world, we need to have that sort of global system in place. Um, and then as, as already noted, it, it does enhance this, this opportunity for universities and others to, to partner uh, with us and, and us with them and provide that exchange that's quite critical. I think there are a few challenges that maybe I could just highlight very quickly in case that sparked a few questions or uh, responses. I think one is that um, as we try to integrate data from different sources, uh, especially from different spatial and temporal resolution, uh, it's, not, it's not always that easy. And I'm sure this is known to a lot of you, but satellite images, aerial assessments, drone data, uh, the mobile field data and all that sort of thing, to put that all together in a single platform, a single uh, image or, or way for our, to, to help guide our colleagues on the ground, that, that's tough. And, and we're still looking at ways of representing that and bringing in that layering uh, that you can uh, in these sorts of tools. And then I think second, uh, the big, big challenge for us is really how do, you, how do you estimate the accuracy of the people affected by these different disasters? Um, we often have secondary data on damaged buildings and uh, the households that are affected, uh, but there's no global standard to sort of then determine, okay, well, if, if X happens and this is the population density that we know, that means why number of people are being affected and need assistance. So that's something I think that will evolve over time, particularly with our own ability to assess what's happening on the ground and gather that data. So maybe I'll, I'll leave there with just the second to the last slide, go ahead. This is just to show who are some of our partners on the ground, including the clusters, as I mentioned, uh, WFP is leading the logistics cluster uh, we lead the global food security cluster with, with FAO, and we lead the emergency telecoms cluster, but we're obviously working with, with many partners on the ground. And so I'll leave you with the last slide, which is our, this is our objective from a WFP perspective. One more slide. 
to, to save as many lives as we can and to change them as we do so. So I'll stop there and say thank you again for allowing WFP to speak here. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.